So welcome, welcome to Silk Life online. Uh, welcome to Silk Life on Facebook Live for the first time. Um, if you're um, just logging in uh, because you received an invitation through the food bank or through a friend or a member of the family, um, we are delighted to have you with us here today. Um, we, uh, we've been on Zoom as a, as a church family, just doing some worship together. And you've joined us to the point where we just stopped to, to look at the Bible and think about what Good Friday means to us. Um, what does it mean today? Um, I, if, you, if you're not used to church, um, I, I share some affinity with you. Um, I, I grew up going to a Sunday school for a short period as a boy, but wasn't wasn't a Christian as such. My mum used to just kind of drop me and my brother off for our moral education. I don't remember an awful lot about it, except that we um, there was a lot of cut and stick and a lot of tinfoil going on, um, and a lot of songs that I didn't know, songs with no apparent tune or rhythm. I wasn't entirely convinced that the dude up the front wasn't making it up as he went along, to be honest. Um, and there was that whole thing about where do you sit, do you sit, when do you stand, is it okay to laugh, um, a whole other set of rules. Uh, Actually, I saw this in a completely different way not so long ago when um, Joe and I, we went on a date. Uh, we were doing alphabet dating at the time where uh, you go through the alphabet trying to do a creative different date um, that matches a letter of the alphabet. Uh, and so we went to the dogs. We went to the dog racing at Bellevue. Um, and it's just the most surreal experience because you buy a ticket at the door and you step inside. Uh, but nobody tells you what's going to happen next. Nobody tells you where to go. I remember standing in the foyer thinking, what do I do now? Um, and all this stuff seems to happen around you and everybody else seems to know what's going on. And there's these queues of people leading up to little boxes in the wall. Um, grown men with little tickets in their hand that either made them very happy or very sad. And there was, there was no knowing. Um, and they gave us these vouchers at the door for a free drink and a burger. To be honest, it was unlike any other burger I've ever had before. I can only assume it was made of the poor dogs that didn't quite make it round the track. Uh, I even placed a bet at one point on Big Henry. Uh, Big Henry was a bit of a disappointment. He started well, um, but he's probably in a burger now. Uh, church can be similar. It has its own rules, its own food, its own customs, but maybe by you joining us this morning, uh, you'll get a little window in uh, from the privacy of your own home. Maybe I can say something helpful that points you in the right direction. I do want to pause and say a huge, great big thank you to all the volunteers and all the donors to our food bank. Uh, I have been bowled over in the last month by how people have stepped up. People that we've never met before, people that have been put on furlough from their work, who've just come and said, yeah, I'll give you my time. People that have arrived at the door, um, that we've uh, we've never met before just with a check in their hand. Chris and I were locking up on Tuesday and somebody just came to the door with a check in their hand um, for the food bank. And we've just been so uh, blessed and uh, and we're so grateful for those people that have supported our work at this time. And it makes a real difference. Every tin lifted, every tin sorted, uh, every tin delivered makes a real difference to somebody's life. Um, and so it's so important that we can keep that going in this time. So at Silk Life in the past few months, we've been doing a series called Simply Jesus. Intentionally walking through life with Jesus guiding our hearts and actions. And today we're looking at John 2. You can look it up on Google if you like, but I'll read it to you. It goes a little bit like this. So it's Passover. The Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making a whip of cords Jesus drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen oxen are big things to drive out and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables and he told those who sold the pigeons take these things away do not make my father's house a house of trade his disciples remembered that it was written zeal for your house will consume me so the jews said to them what sign do you show us for doing these things jesus answered them destroy this temple and in three days i will raise it up the jews then said it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it up in three days 
but he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. If you're not sure, the Passover of the Jews was an annual celebration to remember how God had rescued them from slavery in Egypt. They'd been slaves for generations, but God had stepped in to set them free. That story is a whole other talk. But let me surmise it, that judgment had literally passed over the home of the Jews. They sat in their homes doing nothing except trusting God to be merciful and save them. Hence the name Passover. It's a powerful and slightly unsettling image of faith for us as Christians. It's helpful to us to hold in mind what is happening at Easter. We don't bring a lot to the table. We trust Jesus. He does all the hard work, but we get to enjoy him as a result. So here Jesus is in Jerusalem. The Passover celebration is happening all around him. And frankly, he is fuming. And he turns on the traders in the temple and starts to drive them out. This is no gentle Jesus, meek and mild, I'm afraid. He makes a whip and he sets about them. Now, Jesus grew up as a tradesman. His dad was a tradesman. And I fancy he could handle himself. Not Jason Statham handled himself, but, but no pushover. The temple should have been a place for people to experience God. A place of prayer and devotion, repentance and forgiveness. But instead, people were making money out of it. And Jesus sticks it at them and says, do not make my father's house a house of trade. Matthew describes the same conversation. And he remembers Jesus saying, my house should be called a house of prayer. But you make it a den of robbers. He's fuming. Jesus says, this is my father's house. This house is about knowing and loving and treasuring a person, his father. The temple is special because his dad is special. My mum's house is special because she lives there. In this temple, the father has pride of place, supreme place. He is the supreme treasure here, but the focus has been replaced by a focus on money. And there's no reference here to the people who needed the animals to make the sacrifice. The anger is all directed at those who are selling and handling the currency. Jesus could see through the religious veneer and saw some very grubby hearts. Of course, the religious leaders, they aren't that impressed. This is the busiest time of year. There's money to be made and there's bells and whistles to be performed. What sign do you show us for doing these things, they say? Who on earth do you think you are, sunshine? Jesus' answer is fascinating. At first glance, it's actually completely bizarre. He says this, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And to be honest, it reminds me a little bit of Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars. If you're not a Star Wars fan, indulge me right here now. But there's that moment where Obi-Wan Kenobi is having a lightsaber fight with Darth Vader and he's getting beat. And Darth, he says to Darth Vader, strike me down and I shall only become more powerful. And even as an adult, I don't get it, to be honest, because I want to say to him, say what, Obi-Wan? Strike you down and you will be dead. Seemingly not all that powerful at all, just reappearing as a wafy figure in multiple spin-off movies doing very little. Strike me down? More powerful? I don't think so. The Jewish leaders are also scratching their heads. It took 46 years to build this temple, Jesus, and you're planning to rebuild it in three days. I don't think so. As it happens, with hindsight, we know that the temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Roman army. It was totally decimated. <clears throat> Mark wrote about this and he remembered Jesus saying, do you see these great buildings? No stone will be left upon another. This is actually an accurate description of the decimation that was caused by the Roman soldiers. They literally wiped it away. But look at verse 22 of our passage. Jesus wasn't really speaking about the building. He was speaking about the temple of his body. 
What does Jesus mean? He was answering on two levels. First, he meant, you're destroying this temple. When you desecrate the worship of my father with your whitewashed greed, you destroy what this temple is and you expose it to the wrath of God. But on another level, he's also saying the same materialistic deadness to spiritual reality that destroys this temple is also going to destroy me. Just like you kill worship in the temple with your consumerism and materialism, you will kill me. I and my father are one. If you destroy his house, you destroy me. If you treasure money more than my father, you will treasure my destruction. In fact, you'll buy it with 30 pieces of silver. So Jesus is speaking on two levels. Destroy this temple, the building, and destroy this temple, my body. In three days, I will raise it up. What's he talking about? In three days I will raise it up. Well, it works on the same two levels. I'll raise up my body in the resurrection after three days. He will lay it down for our sin and he takes it up again. When they destroy it, he builds it again in three days. And no one can stop that. But there's another level of meaning. The material temple that would be destroyed, Jesus builds again in three days in the sense that he now replaces the temple. He becomes the new place where everyone may meet God. We don't need to go to a special place and do special things with a special priest to access Jesus. Remember what he said in Matthew 12, 6, I tell you something greater than the temple is here. And he meant himself. It all starts to fit together, right? Nearly 20 years ago, for me, I was on the fringes of a really tragic accident. I was working in a school. And boys from the school over a weekend were happily playing football in an industrial state. And the ball went on a roof. They climbed up up on the flat roof to retrieve the ball. And the roof fell through. And, and one child fell through the roof and he didn't survive the fall. The funeral was actually horrible. Watching big, lumbering, inner city lads, tough, skinhead sportsmen, a real band of brothers in many sense, watching them crumple as one of their own was gone and not coming back. And I remember them playing the Oasis tune. Some of you will know it, Stop Crying Your Heart Out. It's a really eerie song. And I remember thinking that they shouldn't have to stop crying their hearts out. That actually big, broken, ugly sobbing is entirely appropriate right now. That boy shouldn't have been on that roof. This funeral should never have been happening. This is entirely tragic. A horrible, tragic accident. It puts some frame of reference in place for me of what happened to Jesus. The treatment of his body was, was brutal took a real beating. No stone was left on top of another. Loved ones watched him die and were traumatised as a result. But it wasn't an accident. Pilate deliberately sentenced Jesus to death. The soldiers deliberately raised their hands to whip and beat him. The onlookers deliberately mocked and spat at him. The soldiers deliberately pressed his arms and legs to the wooden beams and drove nails through his hands and feet. They deliberately pressed a crown of thorns on his head and deliberately wrote a mocking sign and hung it above his head. They deliberately gambled for his belongings. The Jewish leaders had deliberately handed him over to Pilate in the first place. Judas had deliberately betrayed him and the tra crowds deliberately shouted for Barabbas to be set free instead of Jesus. But the Bible goes further. You know that famous verse of John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave us pink and fluffy bunnies. Easter eggs. No. 
God so loved the world that whoever believes in him, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God deliberately gave his son. Isaiah 53, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. God didn't just hand him over. The father crushed Jesus. It was deliberate. In fact, we're told of all that Jesus endured on the cross, it was the separation from God that caused him to cry out. The moment the father turned his face away that caused Jesus to yell, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Bible goes even further. It tells us that Jesus was in very nature God, but chose to make himself nothing, chose to be born in human form, chose to humble himself, to chose to be obedient to death on a cross. Jesus knew his body, the temple, would be torn down. Jesus knew that no stone would be left upon another. Jesus knew that no part of his body would be left intact. It was deliberate. If you dip into the Old Testament, hundreds of years before Jesus ever set foot on the earth, Isaiah was saying that Jesus would be oppressed and afflicted. But he would not open his mouth. He would not attempt to defend himself. That like a lamb he would be led to the slaughter and be silent. Jesus didn't fight back. He didn't try and argue his way out. He didn't beg for freedom. While on the cross they mocked him. Save yourself, King of the Jews. At any moment, he could have called on a host of angels to be rescued. But he chose not to. He chose to cling to the nails instead. He chose to be obedient to death. Only hours before he'd been praying in a garden of Gethsemane, like a local park. And he spoke to his father and said, if there's any way this can pass me by, if there's any way I don't have to drink from this cup, let's do that. But those famous words, not what I will, but what you will. Jesus chose to follow the path of obedience to death. What on earth for? Has the world gone completely crazy? There's actually a key to it all in the letter to the Hebrew church a few years after the death of Jesus where it says, look at Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Joy? What joy is there in a cross? But actually the joy is something on the other side of the cross. Something so special, so magnificent, that Jesus could shrug off the wrenching pain of the cross in favour of something, something else. Something truly mysterious. Something that is actually the topic of another sermon. A Sunday maybe. Will you come back Sunday for me to finish the story? Please do. But for now, let's just listen to these words from Jesus where he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall not thirst. Unity with Jesus is so rich, so precious that he meets our most basic human need. He goes on to say, whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. You can trust him. He's got you. One look. One look at Jesus. One faith-filled glance can change our whole life. Times like these, I like to go to my um, most well-used resource, my, uh, my children's Bible. And it describes the, the moment of the Last Supper. Judas has, has gone off uh, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knows that he's gone. But he picks up bread and he breaks it. And he gives it to his friends. And he picks up a cup of wine and he thanks God for it. And he pours it out 
and shared it. My body is like this bread. It will break, Jesus told them. This cup of wine is like my blood. It will pour out. But this is how God will rescue the whole world. My life will break and God's broken world will mend. My heart will tear apart and your hearts will heal. Just as the Passover lamb died, so now I will die instead of you. My blood will wash away all of your sin and you'll be clean on the inside in your hearts. So whenever you eat and drink, remember, Jesus said, I've rescued you. Jesus knew it was nearly time for him to leave the world and go back to God. I won't be with you long, he said. You're going to be very sad, but God's helper will come. And then you'll be filled with a forever happiness that won't ever leave. So don't be afraid. You are my friends and I love you. And they sang their favourite songs and they walked up to their favourite place, an olive garden, where Jesus would pray. Let's now take our, our bread and our juice. It's a little early in the morning for me to do in the wine action. Jesus said, my body's like this bread. It will be broken. My body will be broken. But God's world will be mended. And so we can eat the bread. And remember Jesus. Jesus took the, the cup and said, this cup is like my blood. It will be poured out. It will be poured out in love. It will be poured out in grief and pain. But it will bring freedom and joy and forgiveness to many. Allow me to pray for you. Jesus, help us to see with fresh eyes. Help us to see you in new ways. Help us to understand and experience your goodness. Help us to shed those things that entangle and hinder us from knowing you as our precious friend and saviour. Fill us with your spirit and lead us into adventures with you. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Um, we'd love you to come back on Easter Sunday. We'd love you to hear the remainder of the story. Um, have a great weekend. Enjoy the sunshine. And we'll see you soon.